Uh, let's begin. To the Chicano, to the Latinx, to the indigenous, to the Samoan, to the Tongan, to the black, to the poor white, and other impacted radios on the west side of Salt Lake City, our families, our homies, and our community members, we are speaking to you. We are speaking to you, mi gente. To all of those who will be impacted by the construction of the inland port, the workers and laborers who deserve safe job opportunities, the youngsters who deserve to have access to clean air for their entire lives, we are speaking to you, mi gente, mi guachos. We speak to you today as your neighbors, as tu vecinos, as people who love you. And we're here to talk about violence, la violencia. What, what does violence mean in the hoods that are targeted by projects of environmental and structural racism? What does violence mean in the hoods that are targeted by the cops? What does that mean? On Tuesday afternoon, community members from across Salt Lake Valley held a rally at the Chamber of Commerce to protest the construction of the polluting port, or the inland port. We peacefully occupied the upstairs office of the chamber and filled downstairs lobby uh, with song and dance. Without warning, Salt Lake City police officers swarmed the lobby. We watched in horror as they choked, pushed, and arrested our community, separating children from their parents, shoving our elders, and assaulting disabled people. During these moments of violence, we united as a community, trying to protect one another and pull our homies to safety and so we could leave the situation. The violence of the cops happened fast and with no warning, like the police brutality we see all too often in our neighborhoods. But despite the media's obsession with this moment, it is not the only violence we face. The slower, more subtle violence created by the toxic industry, like refineries on the west side, prisons, poisons people's lungs and bodies every day. The racial profiling and heavy policing of our communities is a threat to our safety every single day. The increase in migrant arrests and deportation spikes fear in our families, put fear in our families every day. Plans to build new prisons and immigration detention centers threaten our freedom every day. Attacks on public schools, affordable health care, decent housing, and living wages impact our quality of life every day. The continued extraction of fossil fuels cuts our future shorts every day. And the silencing we experience every time we cry out in pain will kill us one day. The polluting port is one of many for-profit development projects that ramp up the steady assault on our bodies. And it is why we gathered in protest to protect our communities. Set to be constructed on the west side of Salt Lake City, the polluting port will impact communities of color and low-income communities the hardest. The port would bring tens of thousands of trucks, not to mention trains and planes through Salt Lake City's west side. This will increase pollution, making our people, who are already dealing with the impacts of toxic air from the refineries, the interstate, and other industries, even more sick. This is all an extreme and ongoing form of violence and environmental racism against our communities. The West Side will be impacted the most, but all poor working class people in Salt Lake will be affected. There is no way the rich can build a 30% expansion of the city and not have it affect the state economy and all of us along the Wasatch Front. The types of jobs that are brought in by the port, the polluting port, would probably provide low wages and expose workers to more toxic pollution on a daily basis. Any jobs created by this port would sacrifice our children's future, our own bodies, and the safety of our communities. We call on decision makers to focus on jobs and community-led developments that will truly benefit our people, especially the most targeted neighborhoods on the industrial side of Salt Lake City, the west side. Surveys and continued public pressure have overwhelmingly shown that community members do not want a port in our town. However, decision makers continue to push this polluting project forward against the will of the people. 
we see that we have tried every possible way of halting this polluting port through the legal system, through the channels that they have told us are acceptable. And yet the port authority has failed to listen to public opinion and we do not want a polluting port in our town. We see that direct action as the last and best resort in the battle to stop the polluting port and to protect our community when all other avenues are shut down in front of us. Yesterday's violent response by police and elected officials to a peaceful protest shut down community voices once again, continuing a pattern that we see in Salt Lake City. The SLC Police Department and Governor Herbert are strategically painting us as agents of violence, when in reality we are agents of change. There is a history of this type of rhetoric in the United States as well. Governor Herbert's framing of the protest as borderline terrorism puts targets on indigenous, Chicanx, Latinx, and other brown and black organizers who are already being hunted down by white supremacist groups, the real terrorists. The governor has just emboldened these hate groups, many of which are in Utah specifically, to target community members who are taking a stand for their rights. This coded racism echoes the racist rhetoric the Trump administration is currently using to validate human rights violations against brown children and their parents at the borderlands. And we see that Governor Herbert, as well as the media that is peddling this borderline terrorism narrative, should be held accountable for this as well. <coughs> The campaign against the construction of the inland port is led by communities fighting for a just and livable future for us all. We will continue fighting environmental and structural racism, and our communities will remain unified in the struggle against a polluting port. In all projects and policies that hurt other people, we imagine a world where we can all breathe clean air and drink clean water, a world where our children are safe. We want our friends and neighbors to have good jobs and benefit our communities, not harm them. We want a world where we have good public schools, access to quality health care, and more sustainable energy solutions. We imagine a world where people matter more than profit and where communities create their own solutions in the problems they face. Most of all, we imagine a world where everyone can thrive no matter who they are. Do you guys worry that your message is getting lost as a result of everything that happened Tuesday? And how do you continue, besides press conferences like this, to get your message out and do so in a way that does not impact the point of what you're trying to get across? Go ahead and speak loudly, please. This is our message, is um, we will confront those that are trying to hurt our community, and we will do so in a unified manner. That's, that's the message, and we sent it across. Another question is, you guys say that police are likely to respond without any warning, but we are hearing from police that they give several warnings uh, to leave or you would be arrested. Uh, what is your response to that? Um, well, my response would be that this is, and, and we were very uh, clear about what this was, it was a civil disobedience. We are occupying space that belongs to the public, the workers who built this space. It is our right to occupy these spaces, and for the police to rain such violence on us peacefully occupying spaces show that their interests do not lie with the people. It, it, it lies with private property. and. Um, and they use violence and any violence necessary to uh, uphold their private property interests. And um, so, yes, we did occupy that space. We did it peacefully. And um, there was no unified, from me being on the ground and being a, an organizer, there was no unified dis uh, dispersal request by the police. There was not. They did not have a unified dispersal request in the lobby whatsoever. They came in and they came in with violence when we were peacefully occupying. They may have individually told people to leave, but there was no united dispersal to leave the lobby whatsoever. Are you guys saying that you were unaware that police though would be there? You know, because you know that police are gonna be there, so at what point did it get out of hand? Was it, your, it sounds like you're saying maybe they took the first time 
Uh, we were definitely aware that there would be a police presence there, but we were completely unprepared for the incredible amounts of violence that was then uh, placed on our peaceful protesters. We had arranged specifically dances, chants, songs, and <coughs> occupying space. However, none of our protesters were armed. None of them were told to mask up. Me being one of the organizers for this whole event, it was specifically discussed none of them would be masking up, no one would be instigating violence. This is a community mainly of black, brown, and indigenous people on the west side. We don't have the luxury to just go out and fight the cops. So, in regards to that, no, we were completely unprepared for the police to choke, throw, corral, and punch us. This was the direction it came, and this is the direction that we were wholly unprepared for, because this was a peaceful demonstration. This was to show that we were united as a community and had the capacity to occupy a building that our workers built, that this is our community, and we do have a voice to be strong with, and we wanted to show that through song, through dance, and through unity. So no, we were not prepared for the massive amounts of police brutality placed on our peaceful protesters. There were claims that some of the protesters urinated in that building and destroyed that building while you're saying that you were performing a peaceful protest. What's your comments on that? I have a um, what they're claiming was urine. It was actually a bottle of water that got destroyed because of the violence that the cop inflicted, cops, multiple cops, inflicted on the people they were arresting. But what about the holes in the walls that they were talking about that happened at the Commerce Building? Well, what about the destruction of the environment that we live? What about the, the, the violence inflicted upon us by the police day in, day out? What about the, like, I'm not what? disputing that at all. All right. Well, I, I'm just asking you about the damage in the building that they're saying that your protest led to. Thank you. Go ahead. A wall's replaceable. Thank you. People are not. And so I don't contone the destruction of that kind of property. And it was specifically, again, I will reiterate that it was discussed to not have any destruction of the property, that there was going to be no violence from our organizers and our protesters that work directly with us. I, I, it's unfortunate for the wall, but it's much more unfortunate <laughs> for the entire planet when there is a global consensus with scientists that we have 10 to 12 years to combat climate change and every other aspect that comes along with it. So. Again, I don't condone the destruction of that wall, but that wall can be replaced. While you guys were you know, doing this peacefully, were there other groups, because we were hurt when we were here, and there were other groups that showed up as well, that maybe they were the ones, I don't know. Were there other groups? Um, I think you should probably find them and ask them. I mean, these are the people who organize. These are the people who put this together. Well, this is a public event, you know? If someone wants to show up, I guess they can show up. That's not really a question for the people who actually put this together. But if you guys are the organizers, we kind of have to ask you, you know, like the violence that happened as things spilled out on the street, journalists were attacked. If you want us to tell your message and we're being attacked, how do we get that across efficiently? I, uh, I'm very thankful that this reporter is doing well. However, the story is inside the building and the police violence. There is an ecological crisis that Salt Lake City has decided to participate in and combat. That is the real story here. And the person who did attack the media personnel was not one of our organizers. We are unsure who this person was. They are unaffiliated. We already explained that our organizing group made it sufficiently clear there would be no violence from any of our organizers and there would be no violence from the protesters who directly worked with us. This was a public event and unfortunately this one individual did bring that violence to a reporter but that is not something that we condone that is not something that we are looking for the main story was inside the building with massive amounts of police brutality against peaceful protesters I was next to so many of my homies so many of my friends so many of my protesters getting choked out by the police I saw people getting punched in the head corralled and pinned this is the story and this is where the violence is. And so I'm very thankful that this reporter did not sustain any major injuries, but the story has to be focused on inside. This is why we decided for a press release. This is what was going on inside of the building. And we have to remain focused on the climate crisis, on the environmental racism, and on the structural racism and police brutality. All of these things coincide together and we cannot lose focus as a community. This is the direction that we as a community 
community as organizers have all decided to push forward through. What about the homies that work in the building who have nothing to do with this, the receptions, the other people who work there, probably working for minimum wage? You come in and they're, you brought their work. They're scared. How do you swear that? So we did have a worker liaison explaining why this was happening. And so unfortunately, we, we did disrupt workers' uh, schedule. However, so they locked their building down yesterday because of you. So on that, we still have to remain on a much larger picture, is that all of our lives will be disrupted in the next 10 to 12 years. I'm talking irreversible damage. Catastrophic climate change is impending on this. This is a global consensus by the world's scientists. And so I apologize directly to the workers that we did scare the hell out of, but I'm scared. I'm so scared for not only my community, the city, the entire planet at this point is in such a state that we have to take these actions. I'm a worker too. I have a job. All of us have jobs. And specifically black, brown, indigenous people don't really have the luxury just to take off work on a whim to just go do this. This was a sacrifice on our end as workers as well. And as fellow workers, I would like to speak out to you and start organizing around this as well. This affects you. You're being exploited too by the people at the top of the pretty glass buildings. This all comes back to the workers as well. And these workers do have the power. And so I do apologize for you know, scaring you. However, I'm scared for the planet as a whole, and we are part of that. We can't pretend we can just remove ourselves from how we interact with the world. There is a massive industrial project that will bring and accelerate climate catastrophe. Sounds like you guys are pretty civil. Why not reach out and, and extend an olive branch and talk to these officials publicly, like the mayor and the chief? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm talking about in a public forum. I mean, you can laugh and take it not serious, but if we're there, you're there, they're there, they're there. I mean, don't you think it would settle some things? Many individuals organizing this have had public meetings with uh, state officials, and we have gone through the civil process of raising our hand, waiting our turn, right? Being in a place where we can discuss ideas, and that's gotten us nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. Absolutely nowhere. This is this is uh, this is not just an isolated incident. This is something that has been a conglomeration of struggle for many people here today, and we have gone through that route. We have been at city halls, we have been at community councils, and we have voiced our concerns about this. And nobody is listening. And as Anko said, this is something that is impending and affecting us all, and we cannot wait for people to call on us when they're not wanting to listen in the first place. So that is why we're here, and that's why we decided to have direct action and civil disobedience, because it is our, it is our inalienable right to do so, especially when there is a catastrophe impending within 10 to 12 years. Derek Miller points out that um, the, the Inland Port Authority is, is doing environmental studies. They are still taking public input. And it, I think it's important to note they haven't done anything yet. They've still um, they've worked on like, getting their budget set. They haven't like created plans for an actual inventory. We still don't know what it would even look like. So when you say you're concerned about its environmental impact, and at the same time you're working on an environmental study and saying that they're trying to, they're taking input to try to address environmental concerns, what do you say to that when there hasn't been even a project formed yet? Derek Miller is also offering seats for $10,000 for people to come and make decisions. Not uh, I wrote that story. They they changed that. They 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 canceled that. They said they aren't going to be doing that anymore. Probably because you wrote the story. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess speaking more to the point of why, uh, what are you concerned about when the project hasn't been created yet? And that while they are working on environmental, show us um, a concerns. clean port a green port, and then we'll have a discussion about how to get there. There is currently not a green port. There's no port at all. Yeah, there's no plan. That, that's a plan. That's, that's what we're waiting for.
And it's also being decided in, the, in closed doors and not being accessible to the people that are going to be affected by it. I think that's a huge problem, and one of the major problems that's going to lead to environmental degradation is just the simple fact that this is being done in collusion with business interests and politicians without the input of the actual community which will be affected. They say that all of in the court board meetings, especially the 11, the 11 member board who will be making the decisions on how this is made, they are open. They do have public comment. Yeah, they're open, but what do they do? Uh, we, we've already said that we've gone through the process of civility and answering questions and, and having your hand up, and that has gotten us nowhere, and they have not listened. You may say because they have that process, it's an open process. We say because we've been through that process, it is not an open process. It's a veneer of an open process. Yeah. We've been through it, and thank you for uh, uh, suggesting that we, that, that we need to do that more. You but we've done that. Do you feel it's a legitimate process? I do. Yeah. I think we all are here to say that it is a legitimate, illegitimate process and a veneer of democracy. And I, I just want to reiterate too, I mean, I, I appreciate your question. There's still plans being drawn up. I hope that our action and I hope that what we've done makes it a better uh, plan. But I also don't think we should be naive to think that billions of dollars of goods flowing through a centralized port where rail, trains, and airports all meet together is going to have like no environmental impact or somehow it's going to be carbon neutral. Or, like, I mean, let's, let's not be naive. This is going to have a massive environmental impact no matter how they set it up, right? There's just too much buildings, there's gonna to be too many cars, there's gonna to be too much, uh, too many goods flowing through this place for it not to have an extremely negative environmental impact. So I guess if they make it better, whatever, but let's not, let's not be naive about it, right? It's gonna be bad. Can you tell us about what your plans are moving forward, how you plan to engage the board, and what you can tell us your plans by? We're going to continue to unify. We're going to continue to fight this court. We're going to continue to demonstrate that we have power. So if you guys are going to continue to demonstrate, but are you guys still saying that if things do take a turn or a violent, that uh, you guys are going to go that route as well? Continue to go that route? We will never, as community organizers, be planning violence. We face it every day of our lives, and we are not going to be contributing to that. Yeah, and one thing that I would say is when things go the route of violence, it's the police who make them violent. I've been organizing with Utah Against Police Brutality for a couple years now, and they've been organizing for a lot longer than that. And I can tell you, it's the police who are violent. I've, I've always, every protest that I've ever seen, either in person or, um, you know, out there in the world in other places, um, it's the police that start the violence. It's the police that come in aggressively, armed, with tasers, with guns, with their fists, right, um, who attack people. And why is that? I mean, I think we need to recognize that there's a direct connection between the violence that the inland port is going to um, uh, uh, produce for the people of Salt Lake City, especially on the west side, and the violence of the police. I mean, look, it's, it's a direct connection, right? As soon as we stood up and said, no, we don't want this thing, you know who came out? The cops to start punching people, right? Um, so you see how these different forms of violence then continue to reproduce each other, right? So yeah, we're absolutely going to continue to do these actions. And I, I hope that the cops decide that they're going to be better um, and follow their own rules and not you know, violently attack protesters. Um, but we'll see what they decide to do. But certainly, we are absolutely nonviolent. This is the, we, peace and nonviolence is always on our side. This is how we operate. Speaking of being naive, though, you know protest. there are people that are looking to hijack your cause. There are anarchists, whatever you want to call them. That's being naive if you don't think that they're going to try to hijack your message and your cause. So how do you square that? So one thing that I would say, too, is when you say hijack or message or cause, um, I, actually think that, show up and cause I actually think that the media is doing a really good job of hijacking our message and our cause. Right. What we're talking about here, what we're talking about here, um, Extremely small incidents of violence um, uh, on the part of, and I'm talking specifically about protesters that are not associated with us. The police violence was extreme, so I, I want to make that very, very clear. But you're focusing on these, these tiny little incidents of people uh, that were not even affiliated with our group, and we're losing the message of an on oncoming catastrophe. Um, not just um, in uh, uh, Salt Lake City with the inland port, but globally. I mean, your responsibility as media is to tell the truth first, to tell the truth first. Well, if you focus on these really, really tiny little incidents, you're losing the larger message, and that's exactly what we're trying to get across, and that's exactly why we're here today. That was the point so, of my question. You lose your message when you have these people 
parasiting onto your message, and everything gets lost. Yeah, you in the throw mix. it out. I think is a better way of you saying know, it. Overall, it doesn't look good. You know, I grew up in Kern, and I don't like to see my people out there being violent, even if they are defending themselves. I get it, but at what point you take a step back? You know, like he said, there's going to be other activists that are going to show up. So how do you go about it next time? This isn't over. So to address that, this has been a huge learning experience for Salt Lake City as a whole, for media, for organizers, for activists, and for protesters. So I think, in my personal opinion, moving forward in what is needed to help ease these fears that are very reasonable and rightfully there and presented, is building these community connections and building these bonds of unity, is that this direct action is a very uh, intense aspect of our organizing. Most of our day to day, we wake up, look at ourselves in the mirror, and to address your question about being paid, no. None of us get paid for this shit, unfortunately. We wake up every day, look at ourselves in the mirror, and say we're going to do it. We look at ourselves every day in the mirror, and we reach out to our neighbor, feed them, clothe them, shelter them, protect them. Right. Most of our organizing is very mundane. I would suggest to those who are fearful of us, please come to our organizing events. See that we are organizing food collections, clothing connections, environmental rehabilitation. There is so much more than what you have just seen. This was a uh, buildup from a very long protest against this inland and polluting port. That to really harbor these fears is correct. It is a very scary action, but collectively we are also very scared. And to mitigate these fears and this distrust, we need to see more of you out there with us, showing you what we're actually doing behind the lines. And this is how we can build more community unity. This is what all of us have been saying, is that it's not just going to be direct action, direct action, direct action. That burns people out. We've had so many of our own fellow activists and organizers get killed by the police, take their own lives, brutalized, and some of them will be locked up for the rest of their lives. This is not the direction we always want to be, but there is a time and a place for it, and that needs to be calculated and coordinated with the community as to inspire trust and unity. We can't just we can't go with scare tactics, and that's never what we've been about. We've always been about trying to unite the community. So please, media, come see us when we are doing the most mundane things, when we are building up infrastructure as to not have to suffer under capitalism, when we're out in the parks feeding and clothing the homeless and distributing medical supplies. Please come see us then, too. Not just now. Don't just sensationalize us. We are workers. We are brothers and sisters, siblings, daughters and mothers, fathers. We're all of the above. We are just like all of you, but we are all very scared, and we would like to see you all there more, to see us through the mundane. Please. I think you might be the best one. Um, take a 10,000 foot approach to this. Look at everything that's transpired since Tuesday. How do you get all the people in Utah that are watching these on all these media stations to come to your side when the only thing that they've seen has been the violence, the uh, people that took over this building, you know, the people that work there that were scared. How do you get those folks on your side when all of these things have transpired and they already have an image of it? I think most working class people readily understand the way in which media manipulation is real through omission, what they don't show. Uh, it's called manufacturing consent. Most working class people understand this and know this. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate that most working class people see it through partisan lines, whether it's Fox News as fake news or CNN as fake news. But they do understand and have a visual understanding of the way in which media manipulates people and their emotions through fear. If you were being honest, if the media was being honest, they would have shown the uh, assault on so many people here and people who aren't here today. I had a cop grab my throat and he was trying to jam his thumb into my throat, right? I was unarmed, I had my hands back. I didn't even want to touch his wrist because if I did, it would have been a felony, right? I, I just had to sit there and let him try to get at my throat. That is the reality here. That's the reality that's not being shown to you. What you are seeing are is, is a centralized, microscopic view of what actually transpired Tuesday. And I think working class people have a visual understanding of this. 
and I would plead that working class people come out, like Uncle said, see the mundane, see what we do on all the other days. We aren't constantly conspiring direct actions left and right. Most of what we do is mutual aid. We figure out clothing drives, food drives. We work with young, uh, young individuals on the west side to get them to start thinking about politics and taking leadership roles in their community. Mm -hmm. This is only a small aspect of what we do. And for the media to focus in on the small aspect in the worst way is vindicative of their profit motive, which is to sell. Sell, sell media, sell pictures, sell video, sell subscriptions. How do you sell subscriptions? Chaos, fear. And that's what y'all are so good at. And uh, I think everybody knows that. I just want to say, in addition to, I think you vastly underestimate um, the intelligence of the people who saw this, right? Um, I think we're actually going to see a lot of people come out and want to organize with us now. I think we're going to see a lot more movement, um, and I think we're going to see a lot of new people. I think they see what happened, and the first question that they ask is, why were uh, the police so aggressive with them? And why were they? Uh, why were protesters out there in the first place? What's it, what is it with this inland port that uh, people really don't like? I think I'm going to look into that. I think I'm going to start researching that a little bit more. I think we're going to see a lot of extremely positive um, results uh, from ordinary, everyday working people um, as a result of this action. I was in that lobby. I was stuck in a crowd. I know how scary it got um, for, for protesters. But I also saw a lot of pushing back, shoving back when they're told to leave. Um, Chief Brown said his officers have to use force when necessary to uh, fill up weight force when they need to to get the crowds dispersed when the officers are told that they refuse to. So uh, you're saying you guys don't condone violence, but I did see protesters shoving back and pushing back to, to the officers. So how do you, how do you, um, how do you address that? Um, I would say a lot of folks that ended up getting pushed were disabled folks who don't necessarily have the capacity to defend themselves more than they already do. And but, so, but I did see protesters who were pushing back and shutting back. Right. And so we were occupying that space peacefully first. And as our great leaders have said, they do uh, support peaceful protests. And that's exactly what it was, but the cops were called in immediately. And as you say, you were in there, as I was in there, and upstairs, and outside, and across the street. I had every angle of that. And being an organizer of that, the cops rushed in and caused panic. When you have 10 cops armed to the teeth, coming in, grabbing people, shoving them. There was no bullhorn. There was no whistle of a unified direction to get out. Few people might have been told to come out and go. And I can't speak for those protesters who decided to continue to hold space. I can't speak for them. All I can say is, as community organizers, we had discussed there will be no violence, there will be no masking up, and you do not touch a cop. You put your hands back. There is lots of training on this specifically. Because as black, indigenous, and POC, we understand that we do not have the luxury to touch police officers. And this is where it does introduce a new dynamic with white protesters. White protesters do have that luxury, but I don't. I could not show my face. I could not go up there and assault a cop. That is not a luxury any of us on this panel really have. So. I'm going to come back to that as organizers. We made it incredibly clear this was peaceful. There would be no contact with the police. There would be no masking up, period. So you're saying if there was a unified direction to leave the space, you guys would have just gone up and left? Yes. yes. We actually, we actually uh, said that. There was a few organizers, some of us here, that, that was said, uh, move, move, move your feet, time for tactical retreat. We were screaming that at the top of our lungs to leave the space. Some organizers or some uh, uh, individuals decided to stay, but we tried our best to marshal and corral our crowd to get them out because we understood that it was unsafe. And that was what we all participated in doing to get people to retreat and get out there for their own safety. So how are you guys going to deal with the issue? You're saying that the, uh, those who may have turned violent were not directly involved with you guys. So how are you guys going to deal with that, possibly going uh, setting up another demonstration? 
I think, again, like I said in the past, this was a huge learning experience for Salt Lake City organizers, protesters, and media. Um, I think there should be, you know, a lot more discussion of possible violence breaking out and having training among all of us on how to mitigate that and how to have that be outside of the crowd, that if there is some, uh, you know, a street fight, that needs to be mitigated and handled specifically by one of the organizers, whether that's going up and say, this is not the place, this is, you're putting a lot of people at risk here. Um, but again, as we move forward in our organizing, this is something that we are heavily taking into consideration now. The governor has just said this is borderline terrorism and just put a target on all the organizers' backs in here from white supremacist groups. Just yesterday, uh, the American Identity Movement just put up stickers at the uh, South City Campus uh, uh, College Building on State Street. There's a huge growing fascist force within Utah, whether it be the Proud Boys, the American Identity Movement, a uh, few others, that there's quite a few. And we have already been targets of that. Whether we're rallying against ICE, whether we're rallying against the police, they show up and do threaten force against us. Those are the real terrorists. Almost every single mass shooting terrorist attack that has happened within the last decade in the United States has been from a white supremacist. And so for the governor to then label us as borderline terrorists, you have just put a target on our back. You have then put us at incredible harm and at risk of disappearance, assassination, murder, whatever. This has happened historically time and time again. And we cannot forget the historical narrative of where these activist movements come from. There's a long lineage of organizers being assassinated and state-sanctioned violence. We cannot forget that. And so moving forward in addressing violence, we are our community. We come from our own community, and we recognize that this was a, a, a very grave mishap. However, it is being looked at as a community on how can we mitigate this more and how we can combat that is strengthening our community ties, building more mutual aid, continuing our infrastructure as to people don't have to suffer under capitalism anymore. Let's talk about so, no, I think that we just need to reiterate one, time, uh, one more time too. I think we need to make sure to ask the exact same question to Chief Brown, right? What are you gonna do next time to make sure that your officers don't start throwing punches, don't start choking people, um, don't enter a space without um, actually telling people to be or behave in the aggressive way that they, that, that they did. I think we really need to make sure that we ask him that question and that he gives a very specific and clear response, right, um, of what he's going to do to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Um, uh, like I said, we, uh, we, I think all of us here plan on doing more actions in the future and having uh, you know, more protests in addition to all the other organizing that we do, right? Um, and, you know, they're going to send cops out to some of those. So what's Chief uh, Brown going to do to prevent the violence that his officers started at this event in the future, right? We have a plan, right? We, um, you know, stress nonviolence. We had people who were trained, who knew what to do. We asked people to leave when it was time to leave, right? Um, so wh what about Chief Brown? What's he going to do? Well, Chief Brown said he was going to open up an investigation with the Salt Lake District Attorney's Office. Are you guys going to cooperate on that investigation at all? Are you guys going to bring that community effort towards that investigation? We'll, we'll cooperate in what ways that we need to. However, we're not going to be martyrs for this either. And I think that's important for you know the police to recognize too is that there is a lot more violence on their end, and that a true investigation needs to be uh, civil and met correctly. Is that this wasn't just a one-sided thing, and the cops weren't protecting anyone. They in fact choked a lot of people and brutalized a lot of people. So I hope that investigation also includes our media's photographs of the cops' badges, the recordings that we have, and that also being used to sway the investigation. Will you hand that over? We can discuss that later. Do you feel like uh, that old axiom, you're making the comfortable uncomfortable, is part of what's going on here? Climate change is gonna kill us all. <laughs> it is going to wipe us all out. I don't know how to communicate it more. We have to care about our communities. We have to care about our neighbors. And if that's the axiom that you think fits for this, sure. But our motive isn't to make people uncomfortable. Our motive is for people to start loving people. 
Our motivations here wasn't for hate for any other group. It wasn't hate for the state. It wasn't hate for the community. It was love for our community. And that's where all of this really stems from. Love and protection, not hate. And this is what is completely different than these white supremacy groups. They're targeting us out of hate specifically. And again, I cannot reiterate to all of you and all of those who will be watching this, climate change is real and climate change will be catastrophic unless we band together and actually do something about it. We all complain, we all bitch and moan, but what I am saying is we have to gather together so our problems can be worked out as a community. We are weak alone. We are strong together. And the history of humanity has always been a collection of working together, not this infighting. In, in retrospect, did you make any mistakes? Would you have done anything differently? I mean, I think we've pretty much answered that question in various different ways. Yes or no? Yes, we made mistakes. Yes. So if some group comes up in your meeting house who feels completely differently than you, comes in, starts chanting, protesting, are you guys going to kick them out? I think you reduce that down to us just storming up into the building. We didn't just do that. There was quite a few steps before we got to the direct action. So if there is a group that is ready to discuss these things, we do have the capacity and the infrastructure as a community to address grievances from fellow organizers. That has been addressed. However, like we have all said, that we have gone through multiple avenues and different outlets to achieve a democratic consensus with the people who have constructed or planning on constructing this port. And so, yes, we do have the capacity to engage with other organizers that may have not felt comfortable about this. And there would be a struggle that would soon follow for the sake of the community. This isn't a power grab. This isn't about power dynamics. We are here to solve problems. And if there are organizers that did have issues with how things went, and there have been a few, there is room to struggle with them in that capacity. Can you deliver a statement in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking audiences and media? I don't speak Spanish. Uh, we can definitely do that. Uh, the message that we read, I am willing, definitely able to translate it and send it out to the community. Okay, thank you. And also, I would like to say, like, you're all very interested in this act of aggression um, that took place, or small acts of aggression that took place against the media and uh, a wall. I, I imagine you'll all be very interested in uh, reporting a little bit more on what the governor did with uh, communicating with the EPA, almost word for word, uh, using uh, lobbyist language. That, that seems like something you'd be interested in. If, if you're focused on, like, on a wall, imagine what that will do to our environment if our governor is interfering with EPA um, um, dealings and processes. Also, uh, Derek Miller's pay to play, I know you indicated that they said they would stop that, but you reported on it, and that's great. They're going to stop, but what else are they doing? I'm sure you, you can indicate into that a little bit more. Uh, Michael Jensen with the Unified um, Fire, where he was misusing tax money. That seems like newsworthy. I'm sure you all could continue to report on that. Greg Hughes, the, the developer that's pushing for this, him defending sexual predators. Like, that seems interesting to me, and maybe I can hear more about that from all of you. It just seems like you all have a lot to do, too. We are being held accountable for what we did wrong. We're learning, and we're ready. Like, there's a few stories out there that seem more important to me than the wall. So. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. All of these names are board members. I mean, obviously, the governor created this um, illegitimate port authority, but also all these stories are from the board members. It seems to be news news Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.